So, who I am? Um, you can find me on Twitter, RetroHacker. I'm a sellsword and a full-time independent con or contractor. Um, and today we're going to be talking about peer-to-peer -peer systems in Node.js. And what that means is we're going to be talking about uh, building systems that look like what's on the left. So on the right, this is what most of what we interact with on a daily basis looks like. You have a group of uh, um, clients or users who are interacting with a single point of truth, um, whether that be like a distributed system that's owned by a single company running out of AWS. Um, but the idea is we want to build systems that look like what's on the left, where um, the users themselves aren't just clients in the system, but they can choose to also be servers in the application, or they can choose to be clients or both. Um, so they can actually contribute infrastructure um, back to the system itself. They're not just burdens on the whole application. And we want to do that in Node. But you might ask, why? Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to build this in Node? And why would you want to build this in the first place? And based on the audience, I have a feeling we have some strong opinions about that first point. So we're going to start there. Um, why Node.js? So there are definitely some technical like arguments you can make about why Node.js is a decent fit for this class of technology. Um, totally want to hear what your opinions are on that. Um, but I, from what I've seen, um, Node is great at this. But for every technical argument you make about decentralized tech and peer-to-peer -peer application, there's, there are other classes of languages that perform just as well and have other traits that are great. But Node has something that no other community has. Node has JavaScript. And by every survey I can find, in like the done in 2016, JavaScript is easily the most known programming language. If you walk into a room of developers and you ask them what programming languages do you know, you're going to get a handful of programming languages and JavaScript. So if we start building these tools and these libraries, uh, these building blocks for decentralized applications in JavaScript and in Node, we make them available to the largest group of developers possible so we can get as many people working on these systems and make these systems as accessible as possible to the largest group of people. And Node also has something else that no other language has, which is Electron. So we take these tools, we put them in the hands of developers, and then we can take the systems that they build, these beautiful systems, and we can wrap them in beautiful user interfaces, such that I know most of us, we don't use peer-to-peer -peer applications on a daily basis. Right? That's because they're not really easy to use, especially for non-technical users. There's a high barrier to entry. Um, with Electron, what we can do is we can build systems that, or build systems and wrap them in be or beautiful user interfaces such that um, as long as you know enough about computers to use a web browser, you can use these systems and they're entirely transparent to you. And as you as an end user, you don't have to understand that you're using decentralized systems. Um, you just have to understand that you need a point and click. Testing. Better? No? Better? Oh, wow. OK. Apparently, my voice was traveling further than I thought it was. <laughs> All right. Um, but I don't think that's, uh, so why would you want to build decentralized applications in the first place? Oh, I think when you ask that question, the answer you get most frequently is something along the lines of this. Um, power to the people, new world order, we're going to fight tyranny and not Conan um, or corn. And, uh, <clears throat> um, but I think there are other narratives here that are always lost when we're talking about this. Um, and the biggest one, like I think to, it's a, uh, we're in New York, so I think the biggest one here um, is there's a very real business case for building your applications a peer-to-peer -peer system. So most of the systems that I see people working with on a daily basis, um, a vast majority of it isn't the actual core product. And there's very little intellectual property round, or wound up in it. Um, it. Most of it sits somewhere on the spectrum of competitive advantage um, and just pure overhead, where if the company could ship their product without having to spend money there, they absolutely would. Or would. Very few people look at their AWS bill and say, yes, that's what makes us great. They say we have to do that in order to ship our product. Um, when you build those systems and you take those applications and you take all of that overhead, the non-intellectual property, and you build them as a peer-to-peer -peer system, You'll see, like, immediately, your infrastructure, you see reduced in, or server costs. You're allowing your users to contribute that infrastructure back. So from your end, you're saving an incredible amount of money. Then on the other end of that, your users, from their perspective, since they're contributing infrastructure back, if you have stability issues, your users and their perception of your application, they're able to help contribute infrastructure back such that other users can benefit from that. So they're sharing amongst themselves, keeping your application up, even when you're having stability issues. But I think there's an even more powerful narrative, and this is the one that gets me excited. So we're in New York City, and I don't think that came as a surprise to anybody. <laughs> but 
I personally, I live at the end of the one train, um, recently moved there, and there, there's a little community called Riverdale, and Riverdale has this really large hill, and I sit at the top of that hill in a 14-story building that kind of juts up across the Riverdale skyline, so I get a nice view of downtown New York if I go up to the roof, and every once in a while, I'll pour myself like a mediocre glass of whiskey and get a decent cigar, and I'll go up to the roof and I'll look out at the skyline, and I'm from central Illinois, so seeing cityscape, like literally as far as the eye can see, it's breathtaking, it's something that I don't never experienced before. And what I like doing, and it probably sounds strange, is I like counting windows. <laughs> and when you just, this is a tiny slice of New York. There are a lot of windows, like that little chunk of the building there, there are an incredible number of windows. And there, and I like thinking to myself that for each and every one of those windows, there's at least one computer, right? <laughs> And when I say computer, I mean general computing device, anything from a laptop to a cell phone to maybe a wireless router, right? And I think it's been lost on us. Um, we've kind of been spoiled to a degree. We don't fully appreciate how powerful these computers we're carrying around with us really are, right? Back in 1997, this is Deep Blue. It was a supercomputer. It was the first supercomputer ever to beat a world grandmaster at chess. And it did that with 11.38 gigaflops of computing power, floating point operations per second. It broke new ground for the human race with that. This is 2015, <laughs> when we released the Samsung S6. We're walking around with supercomputers in our pockets. By every definition, and I know people are saying like cell phones and laptops are going to go the way of the dodo and they're just going to be like tiny little portals to something running out on AWS. But even still, it doesn't stop there. Your Wi-Fi router sitting at home more than likely has more computing power than all of NASA did in 1969. And what we did in 1969 is we used that computing power to put human beings on the moon. <laughs> with less computing power than your Wi-Fi router. So when we look out at that and we count all of those windows, we think of all of the computers that are sitting out there, most of them are just sitting there idle. We can start rationalizing, like thinking about and conceptualizing about the raw computing power, the untapped computing power of New York City, of the United States, of the entire world. And if we could put human beings on another celestial body with your wireless router, what could we do if we tapped into this? This is the kind of thing that we could use to like cure diseases, cure cancer, win wars, and prevent wars from ever having to happen. And that gets me super excited, right? <laughs> and I hope you guys are excited at this point too, or as excited as I have chills in my spine when I just think about this. And the first thing you do when you get excited about this is you sit down and you start going onto message boards and forums and hopping into IRC and looking at projects that are doing this. And all paths, consistently, they all lead to something that looks like this as a starting point, right? And this is the initial proposal for Bitcoin, and, uh, or official paper for Bitcoin that was released alongside the client itself. And uh, this is where I started. And I still don't think I got much value out of reading this. <laughs> you find yourself on page like four or five and you're like, yes, these are words and I know what some of them mean. And you reach the end of it like the sixth time and you finally start getting a hang of what's going on in the paper. And you like understand the theoretical concepts that allow for a system like this to be built. But then you feel like if I sat down at a computer, I still don't know how to implement this thing. I don't know like if I want to enter into the network, what IP addresses do I have to hit? What bits do I need to send over the wire? This doesn't give you any of that. So you still are not, you're not well equipped to enter into decentralized systems at this point after you're done reading these kinds of papers. And the problem is, if I asked you to, let's say, implement a, uh, a web browser, like a simple web server, a REST API, you probably would not start here. And this is Tim Berners-Lee, like Tim Berners-Lee's original proposal that became the World Wide Web, right? He did this at CERN. You wouldn't start here. You would require Express. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's what we're here to talk about today, is we're going to talk about building blocks that are actually sane that we can use and we can build on top of. And the first of these blocks is WebTorrent. And this is my favorite chunk of code that I've ever read and used. Inside and out, it's beautiful. Inside, it's really well architected. If you want to learn a lot about how to build like proper node libraries and ship them, inside of WebTorrent is a fantastic place to start and study. Externally, it takes a really complex system, the BitTorrent protocol, and it wraps it up in a beautifully simple API that's easy to consume. And you use it just like you would start with a web server. You require WebTorrent. In fact, this is all that's necessary to reach out to the, across the BitTorrent protocol, find the torrent itself with a hash, which we'll come back to later, and take the first file in that torrent and save it to the uh, file system, right? 
in fact, that's actually what we're going to do real quick. So this is the part where this is a little bit more complicated than it needs to be because I'm up here on this wireless and they told us not to use BitTorrent, so I'm a little worried it's not going to work. Um, so I've Dockerized everything from end to end. So there's like the tracker and the seeder and everything's running in Docker. Um, all you really need to pay attention to is the lines. Oh, uh oh, these lines here. The, please excuse the hack is just to make sure that everything in Docker has come up before my uh, I try downloading it. Otherwise, it ends up in an unstable state. Um, but essentially what we're doing here is we're going to download a file and we're going to write it to standard out. And it's all that's necessary is like these 10 lines. And it's going to be this file. And we're going to, we wrapped everything in make so I don't have to write all those commands up here. And if everything works, we should see our hello, our hello world application run. So it's going to wait three seconds to connect and then there it is. that hash that we talked about before. I used the magnet link in the other one because I had to keep it on the internal network, but most of the time you'll want to use something along the lines of a hash if you're using BitTorrent. And what this hash is, is it's actually a hash in a distributed hash table. So it's exactly what it sounds like, it's a hash table. And a hash table is pretty much like a key value store, but the key is the hash of the value. So you can actually put, or plug in the hash to get the value back out, right? Um, and this is a hash of a torrent file sitting out somewhere on that DHT. So if you're running a BitTorrent client, more than likely you're also running a DHT server and you're helping contribute to uh, torrent discovery. <clears throat> and there are actually tools in Node to build these. CAD Tools is a super simple interface that not only lets you implement DHT in your applications, but it also has wrappers around it to make that DHT do other crazy awesome, like wickedly awesome mad science stuff like uh, PubSub. You can wrap this DHT table to do things like announcing and subscribing to uh, different events on a message bus um, across the distributed set of applications, um, decentralized untrusted applications. And we'll jump into the uh, documentation for this in a little bit, but an application that was built on top of this to show you the potential of using these building blocks in your applications. This is an application called Storage, and it's written entirely in Node, from my understanding. And uh, what Storage is, you can kind of think of it as, it doesn't do it justice, because it's so much like more awesome than this, but it's a decentralized version of S3. It's a blob store. And what it allows you to do is it allows you as a user to take your unused hard drive space, whether it's like on your laptop or desktop, something that has a persistent internet connection, and auction it off. And then users who want to upload files, whether it be a server or just like a Dropbox application, can upload files and it does a matchmaking service between people who want to upload and people who have space to store things. It breaks up those files into a bunch of tiny pieces, does like encryption and then hashing on it to make sure that people can't read it and people can't modify it. And then it does things like uh, the way it distributes it, make sure that there are enough redundant pieces where if somebody turns off their computer, you know, all of your files don't disappear. Um, and they have a really simple interface for interacting with this so you can bring it into your application today. And it's extremely cheap um, compared to S3, which is already extremely cheap. Um, but you require in storage. And one of the things they've done is to make this easier in other languages on top of Node. Instead of having to re-implement this API over and over and over again in other languages, um, you can actually interact with a web server that they've spun up. And you can spin these up yourself, too. And it's an entry point um, into the decentralized network. So it does all, everything with a simple REST API. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to create an awesome sauce bucket, and then we're going to upload a file of that bucket. It's essentially the same thing. Um, the difference over here is I've also like done my authentication and stuff, which I won't show you guys because that will actually let you upload stuff to my buckets. But um, we're going to create our awesome sauce bucket. And if this works over this network, this is actually hitting the um, public API. And hopefully, if I haven't gotten perma banned yet, maybe. Oh, there it is. Cool. So we just uploaded a file to this. So there's nothing special. There's no cool ASCII art or anything on this one, but this allowed us to store a blob in a decentralized backend data store. Um, and at home, I have a laptop running um, that I've plugged into my router, and it's sharing, I think, 500 gigabytes across. And every once in a while, I'll check my little wallet, and I'll have extra money sitting in there. All right. So. And I'm standing between you guys and lunch, um, so instead of standing up here and going through all of these techs, or all of this tech over and over again and getting rather repetitive, and we've lost the screen. All right, so wasting all your time going through 
all of these different tech or technologies, what I've done is I've created, if you guys haven't seen Awesome Lists before, first thing you need to do is go to this link and then click the badge at the top, it says Awesome, and it'll bring you to this Awesome, it's, your, your mind will be blown, just trust me, do it. And then uh, <clears throat> there's a list here of all of the tech, what I've talked about today and a bunch of other libraries across different languages where you can get started working on this technology. And then you might be asking yourself, like, what kind of things could I do with what was presented today? This is my little side project. It's only had a few dozen hours thrown at it. Um, but what it is is it's a decentralized web browser, and it embodies a lot of what I was talking about at the beginning around Node and Electron, and trying to make this technology as accessible as possible to not only developers, but to as many people as possible. So this is the web browser. It's written entirely in, it's in an Electron app. It's written, the UI is all HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Um, the back end is in Node. Um, and one of the big tenets here is that you should be able to transition as an end user. You shouldn't have to care about decentralized technology. So this lets you transition back and forth between the centralized web and the decentralized web without having to have any cognitive overhead. And the back end, in terms of development for developers, the back end's pluggable. So we're plugging in, we're just using, if you guys have used Electron protocols before, it's a simple protocol. Whenever somebody hits, instead of HTTP, what we use is peer, colon slash slash, it'll invoke your little module and you'll be able to return your own response across it, which means we can use this as a pluggable interface to other decentralized technologies. So what I'm doing right now is I'm on DigitalOcean so that I wouldn't be seeding the whole time I was up here talking. Um, but we've um, seeded the CAD tools documentation. And this was, I, I'm not sure what generated this documentation, but I've shared tools that were or generated over Jenkins, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is this technology should work um, for developers. They shouldn't have to think unless they want to have to think about decentralized tech. This lets you publish to the web with any static website. And you don't have to think about, okay, I'm deploying to PeerWeb or I'm deploying to this protocol. Um, you just take your static website, you create a torrent out of it, and then the web browser takes it and runs. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to this protocol, Peer. Oh. Hit it. And if the demo gods oblige, they did. Um, <clears throat> this is the CAD, or the CAD uh, documentation served out of a torrent over the decentralized web. So the limits of static websites, uh, surprisingly, are relatively unbounded. Um, I can do things like search on here, um, navigate. We hit UDP transport. I can hit externals, go to CADFS, and that brings me out to GitHub, and then I transition back and forth seamlessly. Um, I think uh, technology like that, decentralized data stores and accessing decentralized data stores, um, we have almost all of the technology we need um, present today to tackle these problems. Um, and that's going to open up Pandora's box of the future for using this technology in other places. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs>